Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan and S. Pierce. This is a Ukraine war update news segment for the 8th of March 2023. We're going to go straight to the usual starting point of the Ukrainian released losses for the Russians for the day before. Uh, all the usual caveats, inaccurate propaganda, Russia don't do pro provide the same figures, but I do believe that these are more accurate than people give credit. some people give credit for. I think over the last couple of months they've been uh, somewhat tighter. There seems to be evidence for these figures coming out uh, fairly consistently. Yesterday we had a record, almost a record number of liquidated personnel, and that coincided with hits on Melitopol, uh, Mariupol and Volnavaka. And I think that is what underwrote that uptick where you had over a thousand people uh, personnel lost. 700 today, which is still high, but and over average for the certainly for the whole war, um, but just less in the last couple of days. Um, Tank, four tanks, nine APCs, seven artillery systems, three drones, and seven fuel tanks uh, or vehicles. So fairly average on the equipment front. Two drones, two Shahid drones were were shot down. Um, oops, sorry, fingers aren't working. Uh, two Shahid 136 and 131s were shot down. Now, I don't know whether it's more or less effective to send them over in dribs and drabs or in larger um, sort of forays. In, in a kind of saturation style, I'm pretty sure you'd get more eking through the defense lines with sending more than just a couple. So I don't know, but who am I to question the Russian commanders? Uh, I reported on a, a video yesterday of five tanks, five Russian MBTs. There's a significant accumulation of tanks in Luhansk happened uh, that happened a few kilometers away from the front line so either russia ukrainians sorry have punched deeper into russian lines or they eliminated a staging ground tend to um sort of opt for the latter so five tanks being destroyed right next to each other back from chivalopipivka does look like that's a staging ground for a for a future offensive don't know how big that would be whether that's part of a larger set of accumulated pieces of equipment i don't know but it, it is odd that these were behind the front line. Well, it's not odd, but you try and work out exactly what's going on. So it looks like that would be rather than a reflection of where the front line is, a reflection of the Russians accumulating. Anyway, moving on, uh, there were some figures released yesterday. This was reported in The Guardian, uh, but there was a defence briefing. And so that's where basically... It, it, defense inte intelligence personnel or people in the know or military personnel brief a bunch of journalists and tell them what's going on. And in this, uh, they released some casualty figures concerning Bakhmut. So I'll just read this from, from The Guardian, but you can read this in a number of different uh, news sources. Russia has sustained twenty to 30,000 casualties killed and wounded in trying to capture Bakhmut, Western officials estimated at a briefing on Tuesday. While no figure, or firm figure was offered for Ukrainian losses, the official said it was significantly less. So this is gem generally, you would think this is genuinely what the Western military officials are thinking, uh, and they're briefing the press on this. That might be psyops. They might have the real numbers. It might be terrible for the Ukrainians, and they're just kind of lying to give some narrative. But uh, but uh, I would side with this is probably what they genuinely think. The official speculated that a high proportion of those casualties, many of which will be prisoners recruited by Wagner, could have been killed. Quote, the death rates of Wagner have been significantly higher than the Russian armed forces, they said, which have been estimated at three wounded to one killed. So... If that is uh, three to one normal, then you could expect something like two to one, uh, 2.5 to one uh, deaths to wounded here. So that would say if there were 30,000 casualties, that means there would be maybe 10,000 deaths. So you could have lost 10,000 Wagner in Bakhmut alone um, or, or somewhere around there. Uh, and of course, that uh, that I chose 30,000, not the 20,000. If it's 20,000, then it's going to be, you know, at, at two to one, it's going to be something like 7,000 deaths and 14,000 wounded or thereabouts. Uh, the figures are crude estimates and impossible to verify, but if broadly accurate, that would mean Russia may have sustained more casualties than the US did in 20 years of operations in Afghanistan, where a little less than 21,000 were killed and wounded. The officials said they believe that Ukraine is still able to hold and resupply its military in Bakhmut, although the city 
city is surrounded from three sides and said the defenders could last for another month or cho choose to make a tactical withdrawal within a week. But the course of the long running battle remained uncertain, they added. So I think that's pretty uh, significant there. And in fact, um, uh, worth bringing this in. Zelensky says capture of Bakhmut would give Russia an open road to other cities of Donetsk or Blast. Russian forces will uh, have an open road to seize other critical settlements in eastern Ukraine if they capture Bakhmut, Zelensky has said. Now, this is a step away from the idea that they are just holding on to Bakhmut for attritional purposes and to fix the Russian troops. It's also to say it has operational advantage uh, in the area, operational value. There's the idea that Bakhmut, and I, I've said this before, which is if you want Kramatorsk, if you want Sloviansk, of course you have to have Bakhmut. You can't really go onto these and leave that whole pocket of, of you know Ukrainian land there. So so yes, this this does open out. I, I guess whether he's trying to really say it's even more valuable than it actually is for political purposes, I'm not sure. But there is certainly the the idea that that these settlements will be at greater risk if Bakhmut falls. Uh, I don't think that's uh, up for debate. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, as far as losses are concerned, just this one, James Vasquez is a an American soldier that's quite prolific on the socials. Uh, he's, he's fighting in a unit out there and he produced a video yesterday of his transport uh, that was hit by mortar fire and had rocket launches in back. Uh, he was taking a day off at that time, so he wasn't uh, here. He said the driver uh, survived unscathed, even though we had rocket launches in the back. Uh, nice try, see you later. But actually, I I don't know whether it's in that same attack, but his commander was killed, who's got, he's, you know, there was quite a lot of things going around the socials about this. Uh, da Vinci, who's been, you know, fighting since 2014, um he yeah he was he was killed in that unit so that was uh, a sad loss obviously for James Vasquez and there was a commander uh sorry major a uh, major Andre Lukanyuk uh, commander of the 80th air assault brigade who was killed yesterday at a command center near Chesiv Yar that was targeted by a Russian airstrike uh, I don't know if those two things were connected I know that James Vasquez's unit I think is is near Bakhmut um so yeah the, the reason I include these is you've got to remember that Ukrainians are taking hits. Ukrainians are suffering, you know, big time. Um, it's just that the Russians appear to be suffering more uh, and they have huge losses, but it doesn't mean that Ukrainians aren't having significant losses and places like Bakhmut are really, really tough going for them. Um, an explosion and fire afterwards in occupied Berdyansk. So again, Russia on fire. Don't know whether that is as a result of any Ukrainian strikes or whether that is uh, kind of Russia on fire. In terms of uh, Russia on fire, it's reported that a building in the capital headquarters of the Ministry of Internal Affairs is on fire in Moscow, reports RIA Novosti. So there is uh, that's that would be quite significant. That's quite a major building. I, I don't know the damage, is it whether it's small or or significant. Uh, but again, these things happen on uh, such a regular basis that they are above. They are statistically significant, and they are above average for Russia. Uh, and that's been shown in the stats. Now, I did a part of my Ukraine War Extra video was on mining yesterday, and it's been released today on on a Telegram uh, channel. Kiev Polit uh, reports that after ten months of work, they've only made two percent of the landmines and other explosives left by Russia safe. I don't know if that's just in the Kiev area, uh, but it just goes to show the significance, the, the the sheer size of the job the Ukrainians have ahead of them in terms of demining. And of course, the amount of mines that Ukraine are throwing at the Russians, that is on Ukrainian ground. So if you, Ukraine prevail in this war, they'll be clearing up their mines as well as Russian mines. It's just a huge job um, for... for for future uh, administrations. Just uh, a real uh, thorn inside. But there's a lot of talk at the moment about cluster munitions. They've been banned by a number of countries. America hasn't signed up to banning them, interestingly. So they could provide them, but they've shied away from providing uh, cluster munitions to Ukraine. But there's been a lot of calls to say, actually, these would be the most effective weapons to use in a whole bunch of contexts. And modern cluster munitions are, are a lot better. Uh, so Ukraine are asking for them. 
Um, maybe I'll do a little video on custom mun munitions going forward. Okay, talking about military aid, US military are looking into whether AIM-120 advanced medium range air-to-air -air missiles designed to be fired from Western fighter jets such as the US made F-16 can be mounted on existing uh, MiGs, Ukraine's existing MiGs, that's according to Politico. Now they have got other missiles that have been um, loaded onto their MiGs. The, you've got these HARM missiles, anti-radiation missiles. Uh, this is an air-to-air, -air -air. the 120 AMRAM, I mean, it comes in different variants but has a range of, depends what the variant is, 50 to 160 kilometers. Uh, so that, that would be 27 nautical miles to 86 nautical miles. Uh, so in, in taking out other aircraft in the air, that would be fairly significant, and they would have a, a longer reach with these. Um, so they, they, that, is, that is a potential for the Ukrainians going forward. They seem to be just getting upgraded on a consistent basis and there's, there's just a lot of talk about can we fit this weapon can they can they work with this can this work uh, and these are always better weapons than they previously had right uh, the ministry of defense of hungary confirmed that it participates in the training of military medics from ukraine uh, said the hung hungarian portal 24.hu uh, interesting and and that's good that hungary aren't just being the difficult sticks in the mud uh, in terms of assistance to Ukraine. They are vetoing everything they can, it appears, but they are also doing some other things. We provided assistance in the treatment of wounded Ukrainian soldiers and the armed forces of Hungary also participate in the training of Ukrainian military medics for humanitarian purposes. So the way that they say uh, they are helping is, is by fra framing that in terms of humanitarian assistance. Uh, Russian media accounts are alleging that Ukraine has begun using the HRIM-2 HRIM HRIM ballistic missile system with a maximum range of 300 to 500 kilometers, which is capable of reaching the Crimean Bridge and Moscow. As of now, there is no evidence of Ukraine using HRIM-2, but there is a possibility. Uh, it would be great if they could, um, and you'd start thinking that the Kerch Bridge would be uh, of... Um, interest to the ukrainians they are starting to produce uh, more and more indigenous munition uh, and starting to so the vilka m for example with 110 to 130 kilometer range uh, is is a greater range than the high mars it's just how much how many of them they have have produced uh, but uh, they, they are increasing the range of what they can hit and that is worrying for the russians now, the EU has moved closer to a landmark decision on joint procurement of ammunition to aid Ukraine and replenish domestic stockpiles as EU defence ministers are set to meet in Stockholm on March the 8th, 8th to look at joint ammunition buying plans. This has come from uh, Euroactive. Actually, there was a, another article I was going to share about this uh, concerning... Here it is... Um, here it is. No, it's not. Here it is. So according to a leaked discussion paper that will be in front of ministers this is in the Guardian, member states are initially being encouraged to offer up their spare stockpiles of ammunition to Kiev, uh, of which up to 90% of the cost could be reimbursed by Brussels. Now, the UK is not involved in this. And it is, there are some people, and it's all to do Brexit, right? But there are some people saying this is a, this is a real shame. Um, this is a benefit to those who are involved in this. Uh, so the, uh, either way, I mean, that is great. The EU getting together to really try and solve the problem of ammunition um, stocks for Ukraine. And this is, you know, one of the strengths of the EU is being able to work together as a bloc uh, to, to realise everyone's full potential by working together. Um, you could do that in terms of buying power, in terms of all sorts of different things. Uh, but in this case, with regard to remunerating those who, who give their stocks to Ukraine and sorting out the real problem of ammunition stocks. I think that the people behind the scenes now realize that ammunition stocks is, is, is almost more important than, you know, providing Leopard 2s and whatnot. You know, if, you, if, the, if Ukraine are firing a fifth of what they could do, then there's a big, big problem there.
um, that needs to be solved, Tout sweet. And um, Switzerland's president, Alain Berset, uh, stated today that due to their neutrality, the Swiss government is still opposed to providing military equipment or aid to Ukraine or to countries that would give the equipment or aid to Ukraine. So it's really, you know, doubling down on this Swiss neutrality that has been a real problem. Um, these seem to take the plan, seems to take the plan by the German government and Rheinmetall to buy Leopard 2A4 tanks for allied countries and ammunition for Gepard anti-tank, anti-aircraft guns to provide to Ukraine off the table for now. Switzerland has a long tr- history of neutrality dating back to 1515. Uh, And with the country not participating in a foreign war since the Treaty of Paris in 1815, the Swiss government changing laws to allow for weapons shipments to Ukraine would be a massive step away from neutrality. Uh, But uh, I guess, um, as as OSINT Defender says here, doubt it will happen anytime soon. Yeah, uh, yes, I don't think it will, but that is a a shame. I've talked to, I've done segments of videos before on how it doesn't really make sense for a country to have a uh, an export arms industry and neutrality those two things don't work together you go for you, you be neutral we don't have uh, you be neutral and don't have an export arms industry or you scrap the neutrality and then have an export arms industry though that's that's the only way i can see it really okay Going on to a couple of really big bits of geopolitical news. So Georgia had some massive demonstrations last night. Uh, As Tim White said, this is so reminiscent of being stood in the streets of Kiev in December 2013. But this is Tbilisi tonight after Georgia's Russian-influenced government passed Moscow-style foreign agent laws, which effectively end the country's hope of joining the EU. And this brought out people en masse here. We had, uh, you know, EU flags, uh, the very iconic... uh, bit of video of that that's that's gone pretty viral and uh yeah started to look more and more like Euromaidan event started today in Tbilisi says Visegrad uh 24 tens of thousands of people were protesting in front of parliament demanding a foreign agent law to be scrapped and for Georgia to take steps bit to bring it closer to the EU Th- this is I mean Georgia is a pawn between it's it's another it is really reminiscent of Ukraine in 2014 uh the pro-Russian government there I, I believe is it the president who's not in uh, Georgia at the moment is is I think visiting the US uh, visiting the UN maybe or something uh, is dead against these laws. So there is there is watch your news. There's going to be lots of uh, Georgia in the news. I w- I would think there there are a lot of unhappy people in Georgia. Um, and then goodness me. And I really don't know what to think about this. This is just um, huge. Right. So uh, what has happened? Uh, um, As Shashank Joshi of The Economist says, oh boy. So, right. New intelligence reviewed by US officials suggests that a pro-Ukrainian group carried out the attack on the Nord Stream pipelines last year. A step forward, a step toward determining responsibility for an act of sabotage that has confounded investigators. US officials said that they had no evidence that Zelensky uh, or his top lieutenants were involved in the operation or that the perpetrators were acting at the direction of any Ukrainian government officials. Officials. The review of newly collected intelligence suggests they were opponents of Putin, but does not specify the members of the group or who directed or paid for the operation. Saboteurs were most likely Ukrainian or Russian nationals of some combination. Right, there are loads of modals in here. There's loads of likely, could be, probably. So th- there is a whole load of unknowns thrown in here. So the explosives were most likely planted with the help of experienced divers. So in intelligence, that's 55 to 75%. It depends which country you're in, sometimes 55 to 80%. But 55 to 70% is most likely, uh, as far as I understand, were, uh, well, likely is, I think, most likely might be towards the upper end of that then, uh, planted with the help of experienced divers who did not appear to be working for military or intelligence services. US officials who have reviewed the new intelligence said. Um, uh, and But then it's worth taking, and, and by the way, the German, so that came from New York Times, then it's been reported by Washington Post. You've had a German 
uh, Zeit has said that come out with more detail that the yacht was rented by a company based in Poland, which apparently belongs to two Ukrainians. According to the investigation, the secret operation at sea is said to have been carried out by a team of six people. Uh, the group consisted of two captains, two divers, two diving assistants, and a do uh, a captain and a doctor who is said to have transported the explosives to the crime scenes and placed them there. Uh, they used professionally fake passports. Um, uh, a Western intelligence service is said to have passed on a tip to European partner services as early as uh, the autumn, shortly after the destruction, according to which a Ukrainian commando was responsible for the destruction. The Washington Post says more information shared with officials in Washington and Europe suggests that a pro-Ukrainian group, uh, perhaps operating without Hughes' direct knowledge, may have carried out the attack. Uh, so on. I mean, uh, there's lots more to say, although it's also worth putting this in, which is, you know, as Shashank Joshi goes on to say, fair point, the New York Times suggested this isn't proper assessment, but partial intel. Quote, officials declined to disclose the nature of the intelligence, how it was obtained, or any details of the strength of the evidence it contains. They have said that there are no firm conclusions about it. So that's really worth remembering. No firm conclusions here. Uh, what this uh, commentator says is pretty sure every single time a low confidence intelligence community assessment has ended up in the press, the public has become meaningfully less informed versus the baseline. It's actual malpractice to report them, to be honest. Uh, what the international community means by low confidence is, I don't know, but my guess is X. What the public hears when it's reported is, oh my God, secret spies discovered X, so X it is correct way to report on low confidence assessment of X is under the headline, the intelligence community doesn't know whether X or not X. Not intelligent officials, intelligence officials think X. Anyway, good to know that either Ukrainians or Russians or maybe someone else, but probably anti-Putin group that wasn't associated with the government, but probably like Zelensky bond, not soon too, but maybe with the prior government training, but who knows really. Super specific and helpful. It's going to be a dogma in a day that it was Ukraine what done it. And this has consequences that a low confidence assessment by who knows whom doesn't justify. So good job all round. Um, a far more interesting and informative piece by Zeit. So that's the Zeit piece reference. Way more details and focus on new alleged facts, not vague reports inside the US intelligence community. So that's not to say it didn't happen. Just be cautious here. Now, what is interesting is you've had so many people. I've had arguments on Facebook, private messages about Seymour Hersh's article, and so many people have absolutely jumped on that. It's like, this is it. This is amazing. This is it. This is definitely what happened. Look at all this. And then you've had lots of people, like myself included, I wrote a big article on that, to say, yeah, not really sure. I mean, it may be the Americans. I'm not saying it's not the Americans, but it didn't happen in that way as Seymour Hersh claims, because there were a huge amount of problems with the claims he made. But it's really polarised people, and people have definitely jumped on Seymour Hersh or not Seymour Hersh, right? Now, if this is true, Seymour Hersh's article is a load of bunkum. I mean, and, and some people on Twitter have been saying it's amazing watching people twisting pretzels trying to claim that both are true, like trying to claim that the Ukrainian, this, this latest claim, pro-Ukrainian group has done it, and the US military involved with the Norwegian Navy, as per Seymour Hersh, did it. It's like, no, you just can't do that. So I'm sorry, one of these is wrong. So their intelligence, either Seymour Hersh's single intelligence source, that he apparently gained it all off, and but won't, won't let us know who, obviously, but a single source, is wrong, and that whole story is wrong. All this is wrong, or they're both wrong. Now, there are loads of flags for this, which is very conveniently came out after Seymour Hersh's article. Is this a counter narrative produced by the Americans? The question is who gains? Who gains from this? So, oddly enough, both the Americans and the Russians gain from this latest set of articles. So, the Americans gain by it not being the Americans, and the Russians gain by uh, loads of mudding of the waters here, and also Ukraine being responsible and Ukraine hitting something that's German and the Germans are being really supportive of Ukraine at the moment have done a sort of a 180 turn and they're giving loads of things to to Ukraine with Ukraine responsible for Nord Stream 2 
that's that's a real problem f going forward. So actually, Russia would gain out of this. Ukraine lose out of this uh, this leak, I think. Um, so so that's worth worth understanding. Uh, I when I wrote my article assessing all the data, I I admitted that I was fifty five percent. Russia, 45% America, but really don't know. Like, I wouldn't bet my mortgage on it. Has this changed anything in my evaluation? Not really. I still don't know. Uh, it's even more confusing now. Nord Stream blew up, and I don't know who did it. Someone did it, and it could be. Uh, I, funnily enough, I dismissed fairly out of hand third-party actors. So I was like, it's either the US or it's Russia, broadly speaking. Maybe with a little bit of help, uh, one way or the other. Uh, but I kind of dismissed that it would be independent actors. I was like that's never going to happen. And now <laughs> we got it. Now all this evidence, or this latest round of evidence, suggests it was independent actors um, who were not national uh, entities. Well, that's that. That was my like least probable assessment. So what do I know? But um. We'll probably look into this in greater depth going forward. Anyway, I've spoken for too long. So, yeah, you know, German site uh, talking about that. Uh, boat connected to Ukraine. So it's, it's all over. It's all over the news, this. Right. Uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is in Kiev today. He'll meet with Zelensky. It's going to talk mainly about the grain agreement and other things. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's happening. Uh, after Russia has invaded Ukraine, and this concerns uh, oil, possibly grain, Greek shipping oligarchs shifted their oil tankers to help Russia. While others pulled back, they made money. Now they help Putin build his shadow fleet by selling him their ships, helping Russia avoid the G7 cap, the oil cap. The EU must stop this. So this is, uh, if you look at the Greek-owned uh, tankers, they had really quite a lot of tankers doing quite a bit of oil shipments. And then suddenly uh, the war started and those tankers weren't Greek anymore. And then at the same time, oh, look, there was a shadow fleet that was growing for Russia. I wonder, I wonder what tankers they were. So the Greek is selling their tankers to Russia so that Russia can do this dodgy oil business um, behind closed uh, maritime doors. Hmm. Right. Yesterday, 130 Ukrainian military men returned home from Russian captivity under the exchange procedure. Among them were 87 defenders of Mariupol, as well as those captured during the defense of Bakhmut and Solodar. Among those released were four female servicemen. Uh, so that's uh, good to see prisoner swaps uh, taking place. I've already talked about that. Uh, electricity is back on in a, in, a, in a much major way in Kharkiv. So for the first time, they've got streetlights on since I think the beginning of the war, pretty much. Um, so that brings something of a normality to places like Kharkiv. Those things are important for just feeling like life is uh, getting back to normal. And that's also reflective of, of how robust the, the energy infrastructure has been. And it's been under a huge amount of pressure, but they've managed to get by and to sort things out and to fix things quickly um it's been a huge undertaking and and is is a consistent challenge for them as each successive wave uh aims to take out that that infrastructure of wave of cruise missiles and uh other um munitions anyway uh, that's the news today quite a lot going on watch out for georgia watch out for nord stream those are going to be your two big ones uh and there's going to be a lot of talk about that don't be afraid to say, I don't know. This is a thing in philosophy. You know, agnosticism is, 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 it shouldn't, you shouldn't be afraid to say, I don't know. Just there's too much. To, and, and one of the Russian uh, techniques is to throw so much stuff out. I'm not saying this is what's happened with Nord Stream, but what they do is they throw out so many different bits and pieces and narratives that it confuses everyone and then they go right we're going to solve this confusion and it's kind of how they've been doing uh fifth generation warfare for some time now it's just like muddying the waters no one knows actually what's going on and so you have this strong man leader that comes along and says i'm going to cut through this bs and this is what's going to happen so 
sometimes there is just so much stuff going on that actually you're warranted in saying, I, I don't really know. I'm going to let the dust settle. Uh, and I, I might, and if I do commit to something, don't just go all in. You don't have to go all in. Say, actually, I'm like, I'm not wholly convinced. I think this is what's happened, but it might not be. Just have a bit of what's called epistemic humility. Right, epistemic epistemology is a study of knowledge and truth. Right, so humility, being humble, just saying it's not. We live in this polarized world where we jump from one to the other, and like it's you just all in up to your neck in in whatever worldview or whatever theory or whatever thing that you're you're talking about. You just you know tentatively put your toe in and then see see where the evidence leads you, but reflect the 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 quality and standard of that evidence in how. Uh, dedicated you are to whatever uh, proposition it is so you know just you don't have to be this definitely happened and i'm gonna fight to the end about this i remember once when i went to uni and my, my parents are fairly conservative i'm i'm not but i my dad used to read okay he reads the daily mail and daily express now but he used to read the daily telegraph and i remember going to uni and buying the daily telegraph because my dad did right so it's just what i did is just following that and then i was reading it in a student union or whatever and someone I don't know, was talking to me about some article in there. And we got into an argument over this article in Daily Telegraph. And I started defending it and getting really angry and arguing that this was absolutely true, blah, blah, blah. And then I, 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 I took stock and went, oh, and this is a really important moment for me in, in my life as to in, in my kind of philosophical outlook, which is like, why am I defending this? I've only bought this because my dad buys this. I don't know who wrote that article. I don't know anything about that. I'm just defending that because I read it. I read it in this newspaper. And this person disagrees. And I'm arguing to toss over it. But I'm not, I'm not attached to that. I'm not attached to that conclusion, to that newspaper, and to, to, that, to that reporter, and to anything about that. And yet I'm arguing this vociferously. Why am I doing this? This is psychology. This is psychology, and it's not the content of what I've read. read. And that was a huge moment for me. So don't just jump into things just because. Take, take a step back and go, you know, am I justified? Is this psychology or, or, or am I rationally justified in, in defending this position? Anyway, rant over. Uh, I'll speak to you soon.